This video not brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends. So sadly, I cannot give each of you 1,000 free golden goblin ingots for using code HAMDAD, because in fact I have no sponsors whatsoever. So if you like this content and want to see me continue building habitats and choosing the impossible, please consider contributing to my Patreon or buying merch. Links are in the description. For some time now, I have been teasing a big underwater adventure. Perhaps you're wondering how I could afford this. No hamster dollars were spent. And not a dime of it came out of my pocket. You see, it was a family thing. I have this aunt and uncle who are a bit posh. And their favorite thing to do is to travel the world sampling various beers. I don't see the appeal. I can't imagine they differ that much from place to place, but apparently they do. And they l love to have me and my surviving family along for the trip. Who am I to say no to that? Especially when the destination is Hawaii. I've been tight-lipped about that until now. It's Hawaii, the big island, Kona, uh, where there's as much to do below the waves as there is on land. I went on an electric bicycle tour, which I quite liked and was kind of the highlight of the trip for me, but I didn't film that because it's not at all related to Hampshire, being that it's an underwater habitat project. What I did film, and what you're about to see, are uh, a little bit of scuba diving, of course, but before that, a submarine tour. Not a glass bottom boat, not those bullshit rinky-dink fake submarines at Disneyland where it, it doesn't ever fully submerge and it's basically just another fancy glass bottom boat where you look out portholes in the sides but the water level is never higher than the top of your head. It's a real honest-to-god submarine. You can go on AtlantisAdventures.com, I think, and check it out. They go down to 100 feet. Uh, later on in the video, I ask the crush depth, which is about 750 feet, but they never really take it deeper than 300 um, I think depth varies by island. They, they're operational on three islands, Maui, Waikiki, and Kona. We went on the Kona tour. And it was fucking dope as hell. Let's see that now. Here I am on the big island, Hawaii. Got my submarine boarding pass. About to go out there, about 100 feet down, and look at some coral reefs. Feeling pretty good. Oh yes, ice, ice, baby. <sighs> Had to slow down. This is the decadence the terrorists hate us for. Tried not to, but of course I already bought a shirt. seated here. Please don't stand up unless I call you guys. I'm trying to minimize the amount of people standing up when we have rock and rolling going on on the boat here. Which way? Are you with them? No. Yeah. You by yourself? Yes. Okay. That's right. Yeah, how are you doing? Good. 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 Good
Pardon me. Mind if I sneak past you? If you can. Do you mind if I get quick footage of the of the cockpit? I've got some people coming down, so just real quick. Okay. Some people are like, oh, are you wrong? Okay. Well, that works. It's one of those macros. Oh, yeah, it is. Please bring them with you when it's part. Don't be fine. 
uh, directly above the viewport, so you have these uh, air conditioning vents getting nice and cold throughout the dive. But if you get too cold, it actually can't turn those off because those are tied directly into our life support systems. But again, at knee level, you have the white benches, the emergency compartments I was telling you about. Just keep in mind where they're at. And in case of emergency, that lid's going to pop open. And again, uh, we have these fish cars in front of you. That's about 50 of the more popular species of fish that we have on our reef. So we do have 650 species of fish in here in Hawaii. Um, I, I don't know all of them. But I do know most of uh, the more popular ones. Um, and we have these fish cars in front that'll help uh, more easily help you identify some of those fish. Started out your attention one last time up here at the front of this submarine. You can see that I'm waving my hand. You guys have to know the name of this side of the submarine right here. Any guesses? Port side, yes, very good. So we're going to use nautical terms today. What about this side right here? Starboard. Starboard, yeah, very good. So this is port side, starboard side. Remember what side you guys are sitting on, right? You call it the things you see, you'll know which way to look. Uh, we got a digital depth gauge here over my right shoulder. We have a second one in the back over my co pilot's right shoulder. You can check those out, it'll tell you exactly how deep we are. Like I said, we're reaching the 100 foot mark today. Now we have 25 acres of reef to explore today. We're going to be cruising around on a protected marine reserve. So we'll be seeing lots of cool different types of fish, different types of coral as well. Some of the three more prevalent types of coral that we have, we have finger coral, so that's what looks like the little fingers poking up out of the reef. Uh, we have mounding coral, that's the kind of beige colored mounds that look like mashed potatoes out there. Uh, and then we have plate coral, it looks like a stack of plates. Now real quick, uh, we're going to do a little uh, <laughs> combs check with our crew up there. We use a device called the underwater telephone since uh, our phones, our VHF radio, they've all lost signal since we're underneath the water. So yeah, we use, we're going to use that underwater telephone, listen in as our pilot Josh calls up and establishes comms with the crew up there. And line of surface, and line of 10, not check on the underwater telephone. Not up there. Hey, we got you loud and clear as well. Our our secure positive points has been achieved and we are cruising above the reef. Okay. Thank you, surface. We will talk to you soon. Yeah, that uh, we just listened in on that comms check there. We used an underwater telephone. It's a modified hydrophone. Uh, so it's the same technology that's used to listen to wells and dolphins as they sink. seeing lots of the other dive it's the yellow tang so you're going to recognize the yellow tang from the movie finding nemo because its character's name was bubbles now, we don't have nemo we don't have dory uh, but we do have bubbles we also have gill if you remember gill from finding nemo he is a moorish idol both of these fish are on the fish cards in front of you we'll definitely be seeing them today and we have more of the yellow tang than moorish idol um, in fact back in the day we used to have so much of that yellow tang that we were once referred to as the Gold Coast here in Kona because we used to have thousands of them. And when you look into the waters up and down the coastline, especially from like an aerial view, like a helicopter, the whole coast was pretty much yellow or gold in color. That's how much we used to have. Um, but ever since Finding Nemo came out, it actually became the number one target for aquarium fishing. So they became overfished out here, and their numbers went down very quickly, pretty rapidly. Um, so yeah, we didn't see, we don't really get to call ourselves the Gold Coast anymore for that reason. Uh, but that's not to worry because in the more recent years they have passed a few laws in order to protect the yellow tang 
we're starting to see more protected marine reserve areas like we're cruising around on right now. So naturally over time we should be able to see their numbers kind of come back up. Society seeing lots of lavender tang out there, those dark colored fish, kind of shaped like a, a watermelon seed out there. Let's see what time is it? It's uh, 1.18, so every day around 2 o'clock we'll see a whole lot of that la lavender tang come out of the woodworks. Usually earlier in the day we only get a small handful of them, but every day around between 2 and 3 o'clock it's actually their spawning activity. So yeah, we'll see a whole lot of them come out over the next hour. Um, it's actually pretty cool. We get to see a whole lot of them. And then, and once that hour is over, I'll kind of retreat back to where we live. We won't see them um, until next time, the very next day. used to do that back in the day, about 20 years, 20, 30 years ago, around the time we first started with this company. We used to have uh, lights on the outside, but we quickly discovered that when we shine lights down here, it tends to drive the fish away. So we decided it's better to have the fish hang out than it was to be able to show those uh, vibrant colors that we're used to. Now in addition to that, uh, yeah, so everything you see out here, we're seeing through the filtered sunlight through all of that seawater, about 60 feet of seawater actually. And with that said, um, something else to keep in mind is that colors, different colors travel on weaker waves of light than others. So colors like red, pink, uh, they're lost pretty close to the surface at about 20 feet. We don't see that color down here. Colors like blue, purple, they definitely come all the way down here. In fact, I think blue is the last color on the rainbow to be lost. So a lot of this coral, some of the fish even, uh, if it was up closer to the surface or on the surface, it would be a completely different color. Um, a lot of the finger coral that we see, that is a very vibrant red. Eats more hamsters.
that said, our coral out here is very much alive and healthy. We boast uh, one of the healthier reefs in the world. We do know that coral's living, uh, but when people try and guess what it actually is, that's where they tend to get confused. So most people guess that coral is either an animal or a plant. It's actually both of those things at the same time. But it's also the third thing as well. So it's an animal, a plant, and a mineral. And the mineral parts are what we're seeing right now through these reports. It's a really hard calcium carbonate exoskeleton. So that compound, calcium carbonate, uh, it's the same compound that our fingernails, classroom chalk, tops are all made out of. That compound's actually secreted by the animal part of the coral, which is called the coral polyp. So there's millions of those coral polyps out here. They're really, really tiny, sometimes microscopic. They're actually in the same family as the jellyfish. So just imagine an upside down jellyfish, and that's what the polyps could look like. And then the plant part of coral, it's uh, actually an algae that lives within the tissues of that coral polyp. It actually lives inside of the animal part of the coral. And just like plants up on land, it uses the process of photosynthesis to provide, try and provide food and energy for the coral. So yeah, plant, animal, mineral, all three of those things at the same time. Pretty complex structure out here. Now all of this coral reef, it is growing on an ancient lava flow that came straight from Hualalai up there. Hualalai, that large mountain up on the surface, it's actually a volcano. It's actually considered to be active. So yeah, it's all growing on an ancient lava flow out here. Uh, when we go into deeper waters later on, uh, you start to get less and less of the coral and more of the white sand. So that's because the you know the lava flow eventually did stop. The coral does need a really hard surface to grow on. So obviously that that lava rock's an excellent uh, surface for coral to be able to attach itself to. But it's not going to be able to attach itself to white sand. Obviously, it sucks. Starboard side, you have the porcupine pufferfish. If you look up down in that coral there, you'll see them hanging out. Most pufferfish, they do inflate up like a balloon when they feel threatened or harassed. They actually have lots of those little short spikes on them, those quills. Now the toxin that's within them, uh, they are very toxic to us as humans, but the toxin that's within them uh, is actually 1,200 more times toxic to us than cyanide is. So yeah, it's not, it's not a good thing that we want to be messing around with. I look straight down in that finger coral, you see a pair of raccoon butterfly fish. Those two yellow butterfly fish. Uh, they have a little white band, diagonal band over their eye. It makes them look like they're, they have a raccoon mask on their face. So that's yeah, so the raccoon butterfly fish. Uh, you almost always see two of them swimming in a pair, side by side. So yeah, that's a, a pair bonding species, which means that they actually partner up with the same mate for their entire lives. So it's, it's pretty... Uh, an admirable but there is a dark side to it. So in many cases, if they become separated from each other, if they go missing, uh, they'll actually prioritize looking for each other over eating. So if they don't find each other in time, they end up starving themselves. It's kind of a, a sad, sad story to wrap your butterfly fish. Every time I see a single one of them out there, as opposed to a pair, you kind of feel that hurt, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, question is. What makes all that noise outside? The noises that we're hearing. So those are the thrusters that we're hearing. Right now, that's the vertical thrusters. That helps us go up and down, yeah. We also have a bow thruster up here at the front that helps us control kind of horizontally, right? And then we have stern thrusters in the back. The starboard side, we have our shipwreck down here. You guys on the fourth side? 
don't worry, we will turn ourselves around and make a second pass. So the name of this shipwreck we see down there is the Predator. And I'll stop myself. We got a couple of bluefin trevallis swimming straight for us here. These bluefin trevallis, you'll find them on your fish carts, um, but they're the main predator fish we have here in Hawaii. If you look down in the hull of this shipwreck, we have a lot of female parrot fish. Actually, about eight or nine of those female parrot fish. So there's almost always a multitude of the female parrot fish and then one singular male parrot fish. So you have the predator here. Sank down here in 1996. And if you guys have seen any World War II documentaries, you might actually recognize this type of vessel. Uh, the Predator was modeled after the 1940s vacant style landing craft. So it's actually the same boat that was used to storm the beaches of Normandy on D Day. Like I said, it's just modeled after it, right? So it didn't actually see any sorts of military action. In fact, uh, the owner purchased it at a surplus auction, and he bought it with the intentions of using it for shark cage diving. Now, fun fact about shark cage diving, uh, it's oftentimes frowned upon out here in Hawaii. It's pretty taboo, at least on our island here on the Big Island. And that's for the reason of Amakua. So if you don't know what Amakua is, uh, it's a tr traditional Hawaiian belief that when your relatives pass on, they kind of come back in the form of a spirit animal that's kind of assigned to the family. And the purpose is to watch over the family, offer advice, protect, sort of things like that. So a really good example is uh, Moana. You guys have seen Moana. Uh, when Moana's grandmother passes away, she comes back in the form of that uh, manta ray. So that's essentially what Omakua is. So a lot of the different ancient Hawaiian families, like I said, they have their own little uh, animal for that belief. And a lot of the Hawaiian families on our island, their animal is the shark. So to them, the shark is very sacred. Um, and they don't really agree with shark cage diving as a business out here in Hawaii. And in fact, lots of them have become sabotaged due to that reason. Yeah. So they are trying to claim that somebody sabotaged his boat out here. Uh, it's not quite the case. Uh, the story about the sinking of the ship was due to a uh, faulty bilge pump. If you don't know what a bilge pump is, is it's used to pump out excess water to keep it from sinking. So the story was that he didn't really get his operation started. The boat pretty much sat out here getting completely unused. During that period of time, water slowly started to build up inside. And with him not really checking on it, uh, and not noticing that that bilge pump was broken, eventually it just became heavy enough and sank down here. It sank down before anyone even called him to let him know. Alright, here we go, port side. Coming up on the shipwreck here, we got some more raccoon butterfly fish, two of them, so that's good. Lots of lavender tang up above, and I do see a few female pair of fish down there. Now, like I said, the owner, he wanted to use this for shark cage diving before it sank down here. Um, I'm gonna guess the reason that you wanted this boat is because of the crane that was on it. Of course, that's what you intended to use to lower the shark cages in. Pretty big female parrotfish right next to the crane. You can see it there. Uh, they're a pretty cool fish. If you look closely at their mouth, you're going to see it has beak-like teeth, a uh, beak similar to a bird's. And they have a reason for that. So they like to eat the algae that grows inside of the coral. But in order to get to it, they have to break apart that really hard coral exoskeleton. Really hard. So that's what they use the beak for. And as they do that all day and they eat that algae, they swallow those grinded up bits of coral. That coral actually comes out the other end as sand make about 80% of the white sand we have here in Hawaii. So yeah, think about it. When you guys are out at the beach laying out in that nice hot sand, you can thank the parrotfish for that because you're essentially laying in parrotfish poop. Fun fact. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Port Saidi. You have a few of those little tiny white fish with a black rim around it. Those are the silver dollar damsel fish, otherwise known as the Oreo cookie fish. Kind of looks like if you're to open up an Oreo, right? So pretty funny, those, those silver dollar damsels, they actually exhibit some of the more territorial or aggressive behavior of all of the fish we have out here. They actually are known to attack scuba divers that get too close. Yeah, they like to defend their little patches of coral very well. So yeah, they'll, they'll attack scuba divers, kind of pinch their skin, pull in their arm hair, so you know, they're really small. So they're not gonna do any actual damage to us. They're actually referred to by the scuba divers as the chihuahuas of the sea for that reason. <laughs> starting to see little schools of fish swim by. They're silver in color, kind of shaped like a cigar. So those are the awama. They're one of the main schooling fish that we have out here in Hawaii. Now the awama, they are juvenile goat fish. So if you look closely at their chins, you're gonna see two little barbels that kind of look like whiskers or a goat's goatee. And that's actually what they use to dig in the sand to try and find things to eat. And like I said, they're juveniles, so they grow up they get a different name. They turn into the feke a'a. What's cool about the feke, you're gonna see a black spot on the sides of their bodies. When you see that black spot, that is an indicator that they have a neurotoxin in their brain. Uh, that toxin is completely harmless to the fish though. But if we as humans were to eat that fish, we'd actually experience lots of hallucinations. And in addition to that, when you sleep at night, you'd have lots of nightmares as well. So the nickname for the feke a'a is the nightmare feke for that reason. And because of that, it's actually a very special fish to the ancient Hawaiians back in the day. The priests would use that fish for their sacred ceremonies uh, in order to try and get that hallucinogenic state of mind. That actually would go ahead and just bite the head right off of the fishes. Go on and opening up the mind is what they would call the ceremonies. Yeah. Sounds like a good time. in terms of the battery life and the life support? So we do have 24 hour life support in case of emergencies. Uh, of course, um, in normal operations, we're not gonna need that, right? <laughs> now we do plug it in every night when we get back to the harbor. It's a fully electric submarine. Uh, you guys are actually sitting on the, the batteries. You have 264 lead acid batteries. You guys are sitting right on underneath oh, this bench acid. right here. Uh, yeah, so just depending on the different systems that need to be charged, um, the 240s get charged every single night, and the comms and the 24s uh, depends on the max usage, but every other day or so. Yeah, pretty much plug it in just like a battery. Bring the heavy charge cables down through this forward hatch, plug it in right here. Yeah, excellent question. know the crush depth? The crush depth for the hole is 750 feet. Huh. Of course we're not going to be going down there, right? The Coast Guard only lets us go 150 feet with people on board. And somewhere in the middle, around 300, 350 feet, as a lot of the systems start to fail anyways due to the pressure. Oh. But yeah, 750 feet is uh, the design for this, the hole to be crushed. Another good question, yeah. Comforting.
port side, look down in the sand, there you have another porcupine puffer fish for you. And a really large male pair of fish out there. Oh, yeah. Nice. Actually, that school of Awama just got spooked off by something, so I'm guessing there's some bluefin trevally underneath our submarine right now. Now another fish we're seeing out here is the long-nosed butterfly fish. And then in the upper left-hand corners of your cards here, it's an all-yellow uh, butterfly fish with a long nose, a long white nose. Now those long-nosed butterfly fish actually have the longest Hawaiian name, the Lao Willi Willi Nuku Nuku Oi Oi. Well, most people think the Hawaiian state fish is the fish with the longest name, the Huma Huma Nuku Nuku Wa Wa. But the Lao Willi Willi Nuku Nuku Oi Oi beats the Huma Huma Nuku Nuku Wa Wa by two letters. <laughs> Now that, that, that fish is actually pretty cool because those long nosed butterflies do something pretty cool out here in Hawaii. So yeah, they're yellow in color mostly, but sometimes here in Hawaii. And what makes that cool is they don't do that anywhere else in the world. Not even the other islands of Hawaii or the other shores of this island. Just here in Kona, sometimes they will turn black. Now they don't really know why they do that. Uh, someone suggested it's in order to blend in with the lava. Yeah. It's actually pretty funny. Uh, some researchers paid a lot of money to get some of those long-nosed butterflies, the black-colored ones. They brought them over to Iwanda to do some research. Uh, but by the time they got there, uh, they turned back to the color of yellow. And then when returning them back home on our reef, of course, they turned back to the color of black. So if you have a black-colored long-nosed butterfly fish, of course, you have the Hawaiian word for black at the end of the name, L-A-L-A, -L -A, makes it even longer, right? So it's the lao lili lili nuku nuku oi oi L-A-L-A. It's eight letters longer than the huma huma nuku nuku abua. Now those fish are also a pair bonding species, so if we see one of the yellow ones out here, try and find its mate, a uh, small chance that we would be the butt colored one. It's Me a too, really fish. cool thing. It's actually a very rare thing to see out here. Me too. Lots of leather tank there, starboard side. Starboard side, you see that needle fish there, that long, narrow fish, pretty unique looking fish out here. Usually, uh, they swim in our school, that guy's all by himself. Best to split them down the middle and have them come down both 
size of the submarine. So when looking for these pufferfish, don't just look out, look down and up as well. They, help, they hang all up and down in the water column. There, starboard side, we got some right there. Oh, and here we go, port side. There's actually a big one right there on the port side. <laughs> they don't know they're ugly. Must be nice. sharp little spikes that they have and get that toxin into their system. They actually, they get drunk off of it. Yeah, they get intoxicated off of the puffer fish out here. Yeah. Dolphins are depraved. Dolphins are pretty funny, unique, <laughs> weird species. <laughs> now, let's see, we you are know, 90, I read somewhere. feet. 13% of dolphins commit 50% of oceanic crime. And like I said earlier, all of that reef was growing on the uh, ancient lava flow, right? So that's why we see all of that coral, because it's a nice uh, hard surface for coral to attach itself to. But as we do come out here, we get more of this soft white sand, so coral's not going to really be able to attach itself to it. But we also see this uh, halibita seagrass bed out here. So that is a form of algae that's growing, and it is calcareous, meaning that at the end of every single blade of that grass is one single grain of sand. It eventually falls off and adds itself to the amount of sand that we have here in Hawaii, about 5%. Like I said, most of it, 80%, does come from that bear fish. Some tires? Yep, we do have some tires out here. Yeah, if you notice on our boat, we have those bright blue bumpers, the fenders on the sides. Sometimes boats will spend a lot less money to get some used tires. Side, we have some uh, milk fish out there in the distance. Kind of looks like sharks. And then here by the shipwreck on the starboard side, we do have a shark, a white tip reef shark. Check it out right underneath the stern, you'll see him kind of swimming around there. And there he goes, he's lying completely still in the sand right there. So most sharks, they do have to keep moving to get that water passing over the hills. But these white tips, uh, they're one of the very few species that can lay completely still in the sand, just like that. Very chill species of shark. <laughs> that's a pretty big one too. I believe that's a female uh, white tip reef shark out there. Yeah, so that line we see, uh, it doesn't go all the way to the surface, uh, it sits right underneath it. Yeah, and, and dive companies, boats are coming out here and just tie themselves to that line instead of going anywhere. Uh, 
the lady discovered they had termites on board the vessel. They had a termite problem. So she took it upon herself to try and smoke them out using a signaling plant. <laughs> So yeah, that started the fire, and of course that fire is what sank the shipwreck. Now looking for that white tip reef shark. Oh, here we go, right in front of the bow here. You'll see him. Or I should say her, but I do believe it's a female. Uh, really good views of that white tip there. And yeah, that's a big one. Some of them that we see are fairly smaller. Probably not get to see. Excellent views of that shark. Beautiful. Now that's not something we see every dive, not even every day. Sometimes we'll go a few days without seeing them. Yeah. Oh, and there he goes. Looks like he laid back down in the sand there. Got a okay, question there, middle. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how old might some of these fish live? What ages might some of these fish get to? Well, Lifespan of the fish. Well, it varies from species to species. Uh, pretty much the bigger ones that we see out here are going to live longer, and the smaller, smaller ones not quite so much, not quite so long. Maybe like a year or two, right? And of course the sharks are uh, looking about 15 to 20 years out of span. exactly where we're at. And with that, we're going to listen in as our pilot starts our surfacing procedures. Atlantis surface, Atlantis 10. We have completed our two reach maximum depth of 105 feet on our lab today. We are in shore, leading, requesting heading and clearance surface. Atlantis 40, heading W, 0, 9, 0. So to 40, 0, 9, 0, air has been sent. We are passing through 90 feet of water. exactly where we're at, and then that way to keep other boats clear of the area, we got there safely. guys, we just got clearance to surface, so at this point we're going to use our air ballast to bring us the rest of the way up. It's going to be the fastest part of the tour. We pretty much get up the rest of the way in just a matter of seconds. So uh, look out and up, you'll start to see the surface come into view. We'll see just how fast we get up there.
All right, guys, we'll get the hatches open for you. If you're sitting underneath a hatch, a little bit of water might come down, so just be aware of that. How about that? Let's have a big round of applause for your pilot, Josh Cochran. Hello guys, thank you so much for being here for the fun time out here on Kylo Fun Dash Sites. Uh, make sure you say thank you, a big mahalo to Ryan on your way out as well. He's the one doing all the real hard work out here. So if you feel like you took care of you, make sure you take care of him. Stand by just a few moments. We will let you know when we are clearing this bark. Again, thanks for joining us. Mahalo to Aloha and Aloha. Beats the hell out of the submarine ride at Disneyland. <laughs> Strategic liability. Yeah, with the line across the that's what it was. All right, guys, we just got players to disembark. So everyone's gonna go towards their left, port side, you go back towards my co pilot. Start with side, you can come up towards me to this forward hatch. I'll see you guys back up on the boat. I don't know. Definitely has yellow fish. Uh, how much to drive this up? How much to drive? Yeah. I don't let many people drive. Damn it! <laughs> About two years of training. <laughs> Not even my real dad. I don't have to do what he tells me. I think we'd make a bitchin' motorhome. Thank you. 
Now watch me drop my phone in the drink on the way out. It's insane how blue that water is. last long enough and I want to go back how fucking dope was that though right perhaps you've heard the saying totes my goats yeah definitely these are the actual goats they're talking about here we are at the harbor
Well, there you have it. Hamster father, moist as fuck. Is that not what you wanted to see? Are you not entertained? What's next? Well, I would really like to one day visit the Jewels Undersea Lodge. I'll put some pictures up on the screen now. Maybe over here. It's a former research habitat, the La Chalupa, which was among the deepest ever deployed at 500 feet off the coast of, I believe, Portugal? Puerto Rico? I confuse the two sometimes. It was later purchased and refurbished by Jan Koblik, a OG undersea pioneer into a tourist attraction, a overnight hotel, where for about $600, up to six people can stay there for 24 hours. Uh, it can be split any number of ways. If you have six people, they can each pay $100. He's just got to get 600 per night because that's what it costs to run, plus the profit he wants to make. You can get a pizza delivered in a dry case from a nearby pizzeria. Uh, you can go scuba diving. They've sunk all sorts of interesting things in the same lagoon as the habitat. They used to also share that habitat with a smaller ha hab called the Marine Lab, which has been used to break many world records. Unfortunately, in my opinion, it was removed from the lagoon and cleaned up to be used as a museum piece. It's still a really historically interesting habitat, the longest running true underwater hotel in the world. There are some in Dubai where it's just like one room of a normal land hotel that looks into a swimming pool or a man-made lagoon or something and they call it an underwater hotel. No, the entire structure of the jewels is submerged. You have to scuba dive to get to it and come up through a moon pool. So this is the real deal. I would love to go there and if possible, bring a hamster and do some filming. I think that would be really cool for the channel. Um, depending on whether this channel ever blows up any bigger than it is now, I would uh, be only too happy to travel the world uh, reviewing various undersea tourist attractions in Fiji and the Maldives. Uh, there, there's quite a few in tropical locations. Uh, you've probably seen pictures of these on my Twitter, such as this underwater restaurant, this underwater hotel, sort of modest in size, but still fully submerged, although it is one atmosphere and connected to the surface by a spiral staircase. Uh, this underwater spa. There's just a lot of cool shit out there in the world. Uh, the number of these attractions has been growing as I think public interest in undersea uh, habitation has increased and the general recognition that we're going to live an increasingly amphibious lifestyle as the oceans continue to reclaim the land uh, sort of propagates. Anyway, uh, that's all for this video, I think. Uh, the important thing, really, uh, was not to, to do all this touristy stuff, although it's, it's, it's fun for you guys, it was fun for me, but to finish the reconstruction of the aquarium habitats, because there's there was a long period where I had nothing in the aquarium. There's nothing for you to watch. There was nothing I could really point to and say that the project was going anywhere. I'm really pleased to have that finished, especially since now I no longer have to sink resources into that. It's just about perfected. I learned a lot from it. I can finally move on and dedicate all of my time, energy, and resources from this point onward to bigger and better things. Ham Bunker, Mega Hab, even Sky Hab eventually. But mostly Mega Hab. I really have to have to finish that and then start replicating it. So that's really the big accomplishment in the last couple of months and I intend to continue building on it. Most importantly for the project, and my heart, I got back and the hamster was fine. Which she ought to be. I mean I rebuilt both of those modules with excessive 
thorough silicone sealing, uh, sparing no expense, cutting no corner. If they failed anyway, after all that, this whole project would basically be useless. I would call it off, but uh, with the new construction technique, it appears they're really as reliable as I hoped they would be, and now I feel like I can confidently leave the hamster in there for even longer periods, such as when I'm on vacation in Minnesota next summer.